This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome to Audible Bleeding. Today we are privileged to have Dr. Peter Schneider. He's a professor of surgery in the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Schneider received his MD from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and completed his general surgery residency and vascular surgery fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Schneider was the founding member in chief of the Division of Vascular Surgery at Kaiser Permanente in Hawaii from 1994 through 2018. Dr. Schneider is a past president of the Western Vascular Society and has authored several textbooks, including Endovascular Skills, the fourth edition, to be published later this year. Dr. Schneider also has founded two medical device companies and serves as an advisor to many others and has been awarded numerous patents. Thank you, Dr. Schneider, for joining us on Audible Bleeding today. Hey, very good. And thanks again for uh, inviting me. Absolutely. And so we, we always like to start out of just kind of hearing what sparked you to go into vascular surgery. Yeah, you know, vascular surgery, I tell you, I'm so lucky that, that I that I found the thing that really works for me after all of the effort that we all put in to be as good as we can be at what we do. I'm, I'm like I said, so fortunate that I found something that really resonated for me. And, I, you know, I think vascular resonated for me for a number of I would say simple reasons. One is it just made sense. When you think about something that has good blood supply, it's warm and pink and fuzzy. If it doesn't have good blood supply, it's cold and dead and painful. And it made so much more sense to me to go into something where I would be able to treat conditions all over the body. Since the vascular system is the highway to every other organ, it means that you really have to understand renal physiology and cerebral blood supply and blood supply to the limbs in a way that, you know, I saw every other specialty kind of getting more and more and more focused on a single organ system. The other thing about vascular that really grabbed me was that there were so many opportunities for innovation, and there still are. For example, the early days of my career coincided with the early days of endovascular. Of course, endovascular has become more and more sophisticated, but we're right on the edge of a few other things, like the use of microsensors and the use of machine learning and the use of robotics. And those are all going to require tremendous amounts of study and attention and innovation to see how each of those trends that are affecting every other industry are going to be applied in the vascular system. And then, well, there are a couple other things I should mention since you asked. One is that I always found it very intellectually stimulating to, um, to have a situation where you have maybe a very sick patient or an endangered limb, and it's an incredibly threatening condition for the patient, and yet the patient has many comorbidities. So your job is a real challenge. It's a test of skill and potentially wit at avoiding pitfalls and really getting a sick patient through a very threatening situation. I think that's intellectually stimulating. And I think also um, the other thing about it is that vascular is a hands-on sport and it's really for people who like taking care of patients. And that's how I felt. I felt that when I go to work, I'm in the trenches with my patients. I get to know them. I get to know their families. Um, I think they are among the most vulnerable patients in the medical care system, and they need someone looking out for them. Many of them have a progressive disease. Um, In Hawaii, after I, you know, towards the end of my 25 years there, I was taking care of the children and the other relatives of the patients that I took care of when I got there. And so this opportunity to form these long-term relationships, honestly, it's true in internal medicine, maybe as a primary care physician, but in different aspects of surgery, that opportunity is mostly not available. And so if you value that, and if you value the hands-on and the the idea that you're in it with them and with the family, I think that uh, that vascular brings those things in a way that many other perfectly respectable specialties and professions don't really provide. So as I say, I, I feel really fortunate that I found this particular specialty. 
So you talked a little bit about uh, endovascular therapy and its use in vascular surgery. You know, when was your first exposure to endovascular therapy and, you know, how has it changed really over your you know, long career in vascular surgery? Uh, when I was a fellow in 1990, I was trying to envision what I would be doing. And of course, the way I, I was trained with pure, pure open techniques, carotid endorectomy, aorta by femme bypass was probably the most common thing that we did. I did my fellowship at UCSF. So we did a lot of redo open aortic surgery, fem pop bypass, fem tib. But the occasional patient would come in with a focal iliac stenosis. This was in the pre-stent era. And of course, without stents, then you have really no bailout except for surgery. So most of the patients that were treated were treated in what we would say is extremely primitive manner. Now, um, patients with focal SFA stenosis, focal iliac stenosis, maybe fibromuscular disease of the renal arteries would be treated with angioplasty. But the thing that struck me about it was how quickly they recovered and how quickly people were back out of the hospital in comparison to the open options that we had. You know, I had a few of these patients with focal iliac disease who end up getting angioplasty. Typically, it was provided by another specialty. Uh, so we would have to, you know, evaluate the patient, figure out what was wrong with them get the appropriate imaging, get their care organized, but then not do the procedure. And that didn't make any sense to me because in addition to doing all the preamble, all the pre-work that's required to have a patient get treated, we were also going to do the post-op follow-up and we were going to be the backup team. This time period was before 1993. Stance became available in 1993, towards the second half. And prior to that, most surgeons were not doing any endovascular interventions. And in fact, actually, there, there was a big controversy within vascular where I'd say most of the people and most of the higher-ups wanted to keep us as an open-only specialty. But some of the younger folks saw that geez, you know, I, I don't want to be somebody else's intern for the rest of my life, doing all the pre-work and all the post-work and not actually doing the procedure because I don't know how to do it. And I think once it became a, just a touch more sophisticated with the availability of stents, more people started to realize, gosh, if we don't learn this, we actually will be leaving our patients to the care of others. And although there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, it's not usually optimal. If you do 90% of what's needed and send them away for the small but crucial part of the care. So this era was a really interesting time frame where there was this tremendous angst in the vascular community. I would call it a nadir. I think we made a nadir in our field in the early 2000s. And at that time, the higher ups in the SVS, and we used to have an, another organization called ISCVS, where each organization had a president. And when we had our annual meeting, it would be one and a half days would be SVS. The other day and a half would be ISCVS. And we had many years where the president of the SVS and the president of the ISCVS said categorically, no, we shouldn't be doing endovascular. So what ends up happening is when it, whenever you have a, a situation like that where the higher-ups are comfortable with where they are and they believe that their scope of practice is adequate for them, but they're not understanding what the younger people are going through, what ends up happening is you end up having a paradigm shift. And that was really the, the birth of endovascular as it was adopted by the vascular surgery community. And so I didn't have any real endo training in my fellowship. Uh, I tried to get endovascular training and was unable to get it. Uh, it was mostly performed by radiologists at that time. Uh, one of the reasons why I got interested in, in writing endovascular skills was because I felt at the time that there were no resources for people like me who couldn't otherwise get training. And so I started to uh, put these ideas together as I was going through my own learning curve. So, Dr. Schneider, you finished fellowship in 1990. Stints came out in 1993. Where were you 
where you were able to learn these skills and, and how did you go about doing that when it wasn't really established for you to learn and develop these skills? When I first went into practice, I actually, in from 91 to 94, I was in uh, Los Angeles in a, uh, a very busy private practice group. Uh, the surgeons were uh, Leo DeLawa, George Andros, and Bob Harris. And these were three excellent surgeons, both you know, from a thinking standpoint and a technical standpoint. And in fact, all three of them had trained in the era when vascular surgeons did angiography. So a lot of the angiography they did was translumbar aortogram. I'd probably you haven't even seen one of those, I'm going to guess. I don't think anybody does them anymore except for type 2 endo leaks, and that's done under CT guidance. But an aortogram in those days was typically done under fluoroscopic guidance, a direct puncture of the aorta, typically around the neck, uh, which, of course, is where now <laughs> we, we would we would puncture the, the very proximal infrarenal aorta. And that, of course, is where now you're going to have to go and operate in the days after that. But in any event, that was the way aortography was done. They did a little bit of angioplasty, uh, like I said, focal lesions of iliac and SFA. So I learned kind of some of the basics there. But honestly, we didn't have good sheaths. We had cut film. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced cut film, but it's uh, incredibly labor intensive and time consuming compared to digital subtraction. Um, but anyways, I did that for three years and um that just only reinforced my idea that endo was going to be the thing that we all needed to learn. So then after that, with each new thing that came out, I just added it. And some of it, a lot of it, I'm sorry to say, was sort of self-taught and learning on my own. Uh, when stents came out, I flew to Phoenix for the day, which is where Ted Dietrich was located at the Arizona Heart. And even though over the years, he took a lot of pot shots and a lot of hits, a lot of criticism from the powers that be, and probably at least a little bit of it was deserved, but he was a guy that envisioned that endovascular was going to be incredibly sophisticated and that we all needed to learn it. So he's passed away now, I don't know, one or two years ago from a brain tumor, unfortunately. But... Um, I flew to Phoenix for the day and it was already 108 degrees when I landed at the crack of dawn. I could see the mirage like visions coming up over the tarmac as I was getting off the plane. I went to Arizona Heart, scrubbed in on four or five iliac stent cases and voila, I was certified to do iliac stenting with the original Palma stent. And that's what I did. I incorporated it into my practice. Did you just give us a little idea of what this cut film angiography was? I, I've never even heard of that, and I'm just curious what it took to perform <laughs> angiography. So I was an intern in 1983, and as you know, a fellow till 91. So during my eight years, we primarily used cut film, which meant that the x-ray jacket itself for each individual patient, especially a vascular patient who'd had multiple angiograms, it could weigh you know, 20 pounds or 30 pounds because there was so much cut film in it. And typically the way cut film was done, it required a puck, uh, which was part of the machine. And the x-ray tech would typically work up a sweat uh, in developing the film. So you would do a run of images and out of that, uh, the films would be taken at one or two per second. And the x-ray tech would run down the hall and develop the films and bring back a whole stack, maybe 10, maybe 12, maybe more separate films, put them up on the lighted x-ray board. And maybe one or two of those would capture what you needed. And if they didn't, you'd have to do it again. And this had to be done for each location. So, for example, an aortogram with runoff could be incredibly painstaking to get all the images that you needed. And just the, the amount of physical work to do it, the amount of radiation. And then what you were left with was this pounds and pounds of film, a lot of which 
actually didn't show what you wanted because it was taken at a time when either the contrast hadn't progressed to where you wanted or where the contrast was already passed through where you wanted. The development of digital subtraction and geography was one of those major, major steps that convinced people actually, no, this isn't that amazingly complicated and onerous. This can be done in a day's work. And of course, DSA is what we use now, even with portable units. It's better than what we had then with cut film. So having that, I think, has really propelled us forward. And like I said, it's something now you would probably take for granted because you wouldn't have seen how labor intensive the prior way of doing it was. So how long was the process from when you first started to learn in the vascular to when you said, you know, I need this book and it came out? Was this a matter of a couple of years? It's hard for us sometimes to get perspective on how things have changed. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, as I said, at this time that I'm describing, kind of the early 90s, there really was not that much to endovascular. I mean, the filming that I described was labor intensive and time consuming, but we really didn't have that much and we really couldn't do that much. Your choices of wires, catheters, this was very limited. Typically, if you needed a catheter shape that you didn't have, you would try to warm it up and reshape it and use it that way. I mean, it was really a lot of stuff was being just sort of made up on a day-by-day basis. So the total knowledge that went into it wasn't anything like what we have today. But nevertheless, I started thinking about writing these things down early on because, again, I felt like there weren't resources for people like me. There were two kinds of resources out there at the time. One was that someone would write a book and tell about their amazing experience of how they'd done a thousand of this or that procedure and there were no complications and you should do it too. That was one kind of book, Um, you know, kind of a thumping my chest kind of thing. The the other kind of book was um, the, the issue was really all around kind of the academics of it and not the how to do things, sort of assuming that you would get your training on the job. And people weren't really talking about that. There was angioplasty going on now in different vascular beds. So there was some academic, you know, data collection behind that. And that typically would be in a book. But if you just said, look, how do I get a patient safely through this in a step-by-step manner? So I wrote the book imagining that I'm standing next to the fellow or I'm just whispering there in the ear of the person doing the procedure. Hey, try this. Hey, what about that? Hey, don't forget. You might want to go from the other side now because this side's not working. You know, those kinds of just sort of practical everyday things that um, that I couldn't find anywhere. The kinds of things that had there been a fellowship available in this kind of work at the time, I would have done it. I would have learned those things and moved on. Uh, but it wasn't available to me. So um, that's what I did. I just put it together in a book. It took me a couple years getting up early and working. You know, of course, my wife probably thought I was crazy. Another labor of love uh, that where, where you're pushing yourself to get something done. So you have to do it during off hours because you're too busy the rest of the time. Um But uh, and the other thing that was really valuable in those days was there was a small cadre of people that at the time appear to be old, but at then at that point were young who recognized this many of the same things I did. And so I had friends that I would very often exchange ideas with or I would go visit and see what they were using for this or that procedure. You know, people like uh, Mike Silva uh, was down in Texas at that time at uh, Lubbock. Uh, Sam On was at UCLA. Kim Hodgson, uh, who I believe is going to be SBS president soon. Um, At the beginning of his career, he was one of the few people that was really pushing for surgeons to get good imaging and to really focus on that. And then Alan Lumsden uh, was doing the same thing at Emory at the time. In the aortic world, Uh, Roy Greenberg, who I didn't know well at that time, but I knew later, and Tim Tudor and Rod White, they were all along the same pathway looking at 
ways to bring treatment to aortic aneurysm disease. And so just exchanging ideas with these folks and uh, the back and forth was really rewarding. I think it helped a lot of us who were very often taking a lot of criticism from our colleagues and certainly from the higher ups about how this shouldn't be part of our scope of practice or how you'll never be able to learn this or that because we don't have a place to work that has decent imaging. You know, these types of criticisms that we've finally gotten past now as a specialty, I would say. And so then over, you know, the past 20, 30 years, you know, the endovascular therapy really has exploded. And, you know, your third edition of this book is pretty much mandatory reading for a lot of vascular fellows. You're working on a new edition now, the fourth edition, uh, coming out soon. What are some of the major changes and some exciting things that are going to be coming out with this new edition? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I'm uh, I'm really excited about it, actually. Um, The book should be out in July. That's my my plan. Um, There, a lot has changed since the last edition, so. A lot has been added because of that. There are uh, several new chapters. There are several things that I go into greater depth and other things that I didn't really talk about in the last edition because they really weren't ready for prime time. But um, there are more than 90 new drawings in the book, which I think people, I, I like the drawings. I learn a lot just by actually sitting down and configuring in a graphical form sort of how something ought to be done. More than 50 of the previous drawings have been revised or modified so that they're updated with the latest techniques. So now there are going to be hundreds of of drawings in this book, which I think will be helpful. There are new chapters. There are things like, uh, for example, TCAR, uh, a lot on complex lower extremity revascularization, including tibials, uh, popliteal occlusions, retrograde access, pedal artery work, uh, closure devices, large bore closure. Um, There's a whole new chapter on hybrid procedures, conduits, uh, adjunctive techniques that you might add to an aortic aneurysm or thoracic aneurysm uh, stent graft procedure, uh, DCB angioplasty. So a lot of things that I've either added or gone into greater depth that I think will be helpful for people. And, you know, you you may know this, but the the last edition was translated into Greek, Spanish, Chinese, Portuguese. (laughs) It was really, really rewarding that people would look at these and say, hey, you know, the colleagues that I have back in my home country, they would really benefit from this. I mean, all of these translations came usually was somebody I didn't know would approach me and say, hey, uh, we, we would really like to have this translated. Um, w- would this be OK? And, you know, I'd put them in touch with the publisher and they'd go and do it. I mean, I, I don't really know Greek or Chinese, but nevertheless, uh, what, what's ended up happening is uh, because of this book, I've honestly I've made friends all over the world. Uh, and it's mostly just by people approaching me. You know, I have sometimes a friend in Spain or Jordan or Egypt or somebody who comes up to me and says, hey, you know, I really appreciate this because this was what I used when I started or something like this. Of course, vascular is, you know, I went through all the reasons why, why I like it. But there are other things. And one is that we're small. And because we're small, we wear the same stripes. We fight the same battles. And we have a lot of times more in common with people who live thousands of miles away from us than we do even with our next door neighbor. The other thing is vascular is becoming a lot more international. There's a lot of cross-pollination now. It's really common to have in the Journal of Vascular Surgery studies published from different countries around the world, whether it's Brazil or Japan or or, or, or another country where they're doing sophisticated research or sophisticated clinical studies that we need to know about. And I don't think the book Endovascular Skills was what brought the world together and by any stretch. I think this is just, I'm describing a byproduct of the field itself. But I've benefited tremendously uh, from the fact that people in different countries have found it useful. Some of the people that were my best, I won't say trainees, but I've had fellows that came from, from different countries. Uh, typically, these are fully qualified vascular surgeons, and they're just coming to learn a little bit more. Uh, and um, 
and these are some of my my best friends in um, in the vascular world. I mean, my my daughter's in Spain on a trip, and she gets her passport stolen, and and I can call a friend in Spain <laughs> to make sure she's okay, and she gets taken care of, and that she gets to the right consulate at the right time. And this is all because vascular has become tremendously more international. I think you maybe minimized the impact that this book had, but I've got a statement, not a question. But, you know, when I started in vascular, I think I finished my fellowship in 2003. So I did a one-year fellowship in 2002. We went to the Moore Conference very early on. It was in September, you know, early in our fellowship. And we got a copy of your book. And in a way, it was like being introduced into the vascular community, the, you know, the, the conference and the book itself. And the fact that it was so practical and that all the fellows got it, it is really sort of a unifying thing. So, I, you know, it's not uh, it, it was really one of the more impactful books I had during my early training. I'm glad it was of value. I'll be sure and let my wife know <laughs> since I was up at 430 in the morning working on that instead of going surfing like I should have. <laughs> uh, one question we wanted to ask is, you know, we're all uh, learning endovascular techniques ourselves on a daily basis and training residents in it, you know, general surgery residents primarily. What advice do you have for training residents and fellows in endovascular techniques? So when I started, I, you know, I was trained only to do open surgery. So I had a lot of confidence in my ability to do open surgery. And I felt that although I may not be able to handle every single thing, I could handle most things. And of course, it's a process. But I think now there's so much emphasis on endovascular. I would say probably the residents and fellows should try to get as much open experience as they can. I know that's not exactly the question you asked, but at the end of the day, your question is about how can you be as good as possible? How can you be as good as you can possibly be? And that's how you're of most value to the patient. So I think the residents and fellows training today, the open surgery that they end up doing in, the, in their career, um, they'll be probably called upon to be doing the most difficult cases. They won't be the simple infrarenal aortic cases. They'll be the suprarenal cases, for example. They won't be a bypass to a five millimeter SFA. It'll be a bypass to a one and a half millimeter common plantar. So I believe that um, getting more open is probably the thing that I would advise. I think people miss this fact. You know, you don't need to do a million cases to be good. You need to learn everything you possibly can from each case that you do. You know, why are you there? How do you position things? What's the step by step? The fact that there are fewer open cases should really prompt residents and fellows to kind of go through the case in a step by step manner before they start while they're doing it and then to review it again after they do it. And I think by doing this, we can have the best hope of being well rounded when we're finished. The other major, major transition that I didn't talk about in the evolution of endovascular is that in the early days of endovascular, where most of our confidence was really in open and not in endo, and most of our tools were developed for open and not for endo, and a lot of things hadn't been developed yet, the backup plan for a case that didn't go well with endo or that you couldn't do with endovascular would be basically open. And the discussion was always, all right, when do we open? And now endovascular's gotten good enough that uh, most of the time, if there's a complication or problem with endovascular, most of the time you can fix it with endovascular. But one of the things I'm really adamant about is that when someone is doing a case, that they need to know before they start what their bailout options are, what their contingency plans are, what their escalation policy is. And it may not be that you're going to go immediately to open. In fact, that's extremely rare now. But honestly, if your contingency plan involves having covered stents on the shelf and they're not there, then you're not doing the patient any great service by not having thought through the possibilities. So you asked about endo, and I guess that's it. That's the part about endo that I would say is key, is that what your escalation policy is, what your contingencies are making sure that those devices that you need for that are on the shelf, 
making sure that the preparation that you need is done. For example, if you think there's a decent chance you're going to need proximal access, then you better have the arm ready to go. If there's a pretty good chance that you're going to need distal access, then you better have the foot ready to go or wherever your distal alternative access site is. And um, I, I think thinking through all those things, that's all stuff that happens before the case. This is not some major technical tour de force that happens during. It, it's all the thinking that goes into beforehand. Uh, yeah, I think that's excellent advice. Is there anything that you are a stickler about in the OR? Some like fine point that really matters to you that other people may not be as concerned about, something you think is important? I, I mentioned this idea of having your contingency plan. That's one of them. The other one, honestly, is the, <laughs> I know this probably sounds ridiculous, but the actual access site. The most common complication we deal with are access-related complications. I mean, if you think through, okay, what's the optimal access site and what's the optimal way to do it? You know, you saved headaches, you saved uh, extra days in the hospital, extra transfusions, extra infections. So I've gotten to the point now where I don't do an access without ultrasound. Almost always they're done with micropuncture. Almost always there are things that are at least discussed prior to the beginning of the case about what's the best access site in case of this, in case of that, or what's our plan for this case. And the access site has to reflect it. So that's one. You know, the other one, and this is a little bit more amorphous, if you will, but honestly, I think the patient is best served if you check your ego at the door. In other words, you have to have confidence in yourself, your abilities, and in your thought process to be bold enough to think, oh, you know, I'm going to take this patient with this incredibly threatening condition. And I'm going to get them through it smoothly. So I'm not saying that you're going to leave your confidence behind, but you have to leave your arrogance behind. You have to be willing to look at a situation and be able to be judicious about it and to respond to the, the warning signs. And like I said, check your ego at the door so that you'll be of the highest possible value to the patient, that if somebody makes a suggestion, you don't just reject it out of hand. If it's coming from someone that you think is a, sort of a different level than you are, it, it may actually be a good suggestion. So it's more amorphous. It's maybe more of a style than an actual thing, but you can turn that concept into an asset in taking care of these sick patients. So I know, Dr. Schneider, you've written a whole book on techniques, but a common question we ask uh, people is, what's a useful technique that's gotten you out of a bind in the operating room? Uh, I got a couple ideas about that. One is, um, there is, uh, and probably you have this in your armamentarium, but there are different sized articulating sheaths. Um, and I first used an articulating sheath because we were part of the anchor registry, which was... Uh, studying the uh, endo anchors. And that's a large articulating sheath that you can use to, to angle the tip to, to point toward the aortic wall at a 90 degree angle and, and now allow placement of endo anchors. And now there are a whole cadre of different sized articulating sheaths. And I've gotten out of all kinds of trouble <laughs> with, with the use of articulating sheaths where you get a wire that's in the wrong place or you get a wire wrap or you get a, you know, a fenestration that's not in the right place and, and you don't have a way to manipulate. Uh, this articulating sheath is helpful. So that's one. And uh, just having those available, both the smaller and larger ones. Another uh, thing that I always remind the fellows and they typically forget that actually there is a patient under the drapes. And the patient can actually help you sometimes. So, for example, if, if you're trying to cannulate a tough arch vessel, having the patient take a deep breath and hold it can sometimes really change the anatomy. Uh, if you're trying to cross an occlusion at the ankle, sometimes plantar flexion of the foot really straightens the artery. If it's in the DP or uh, extension at the ankle can straighten the artery if you're working your way through a posterior tib or common plantar. So I think that kind of concept, that technique is just don't forget there's a patient under the drapes and that the patient can help you 
And you can manipulate the anatomy to make it more friendly sometimes and make it more possible for you to manipulate the things you need to do to do the treatment that you planned. Yeah, those are fantastic uh, tips. Uh, one thing that we just wanted to touch on briefly is we know you're a leader in the field of innovation and driving forward some of the treatments for critical limb ischemia. And I know you just gave a talk at the University of St. Louis, thanks to Twitter. I was hoping you could tell us uh, some of the exciting things that you see in the future for treating uh, critical limb ischemia. I did a, a visit to uh, WashU in St. Louis. It was it was fantastic. They have a terrific program there. Um, I've been friends for a long time with a number of the the docs that are on the staff there. And um, this is, you know, a a really excellent program for both open and endo. But anyways, yeah, so critical limb ischemia, honestly, this is our mandate. I mean, treatment for claudication is important, but critical limb raises the, the whole process by an order of magnitude in terms of the cost to society, the burden to the family, the disaster for the patient, if they lose a leg, say, for example, when they come and it's too late. I think when I look at where we are going forward as a vascular specialty, I think critical limb, you know, with all the success of cancer treatments and heart treatments with uh, cardiovascular mortality rates dropping and cancer mortality rates dropping, What this leaves is a massive population of people with an incredible burden of atherosclerosis, many of whom would not have lived as long in a previous generation, now surviving decades, for example, with diabetes or even with renal insufficiency or failure. So I think actually we are looking at the potential that critical limb for a lot of us will become most of what we do. And we will all be treating it in in larger numbers than we did before. So I think with critical limb ischemia, it's important to know that uh, I don't think bypass is going to go away. I think the best trial is going to add a lot of important information. I think also that um, there were numerous validation studies that have been published now, maybe uh, six or seven different validation studies that have been published that look at the Wi-Fi criteria and the staging of critical limb from stages one through four, um, five, of course, being unsalvageable. But when you look at the at stages one through four, what you see is that in stage four, these patients are different than a stage one, higher risk of limb loss, more tissue damage, worse ischemia, more infection, This, I think, is probably where bypass is going to find its home. Patients with more extensive disease and more critical situations, if you think of critical limb ischemia and you just compare it to cancer, there are tremendous similarities. So, for example, there are people with carcinoma in situ who require a localized procedure to solve their problem. And then there are other people that have stage four advanced metastatic uh, cancer whose life expectancy is extremely limited. And that's really how critical limb is. And I think that in a broader sense, the life expectancy with some different types of cancer is better than the life expectancy with critical limb ischemia. So, you know, I'm optimistic. You know, I've just laid down now a marker for what I'm describing as this huge onslaught of people with critical limb, but I'm also feeling cautiously optimistic about our ability to take care of them. There's a larger workforce of people who are interested in it now than ever. We have new standards for things like Wi-Fi criteria, and soon we'll have an anatomic staging classification, uh, the so-called glass classification, which uh, looks at the anatomy. That's the piece that's missing from Wi-Fi. I think when you combine these, the the staging of infection, uh, foot damage, And uh, also you throw in the anatomy, then we'll have a better sense of which patients should get what kind of treatment. Lastly, I'll just say, I think the value proposition for, dare I use the P word, paclitaxel, in patients with critical limb ischemia or CLTI, as we're now terming it, is really different than the value proposition for claudicators, uh, partly because the life expectancy uh, difference between the two groups 
partly because with critical limb, it's by definition a limb salvage issue, which is closely linked to mortality. Whereas with claudicators, it's not a limb salvage issue, it's a lifestyle issue. So this um, difference in these two populations is, is important. And I think we'll sort of differentiate this going forward as this concern about paclitaxel uh, is sorted out in the coming months. So I don't know if you have any more questions about critical limb or about paclitaxel, but these are, I think, two really major issues that are confronting the whole vascular community right now. So, yeah, we, we did have a um, podcast on paclitaxel. Do you uh, still find a role for it in your practice right now? How do you use the paclitaxel coded devices? Yes. Well, I, I did hear your podcast. It was well done. Um, well, l- let's just look big picture for a second. One thing that's really worth mentioning right up front is that I think that if we do not have the added advantage of drug delivery with our treatments for lower extremity occlusive disease, I think we will be turning the clock back 10 years in terms of what we can offer. You know, prior to the use of paclitaxel, we had maybe not an epidemic, but we sure had a lot of patients with instant restenosis from the use of bare metal stents. And these patients, of course, have accumulated in the thousands uh, throughout the United States and around the world. And I think paclitaxel really made a big contribution toward resolving that issue or improving it significantly. I think also that the ability for us to get across multi-level lesions and long occlusions and even across joints like popliteal or ankle has improved dramatically. And yet, even though we can get these arteries open, without drug delivery, our patency rates, our ability to keep them open is, I think, going to remain poor. So I think the drug delivery era was a major, major advance. Okay, so now let's look at the other side. Now there's this possibility that the so-called drug delivery era comes with unanticipated risks uh, in the form of a meta-analysis looking at randomized trials that picked up what is said to be a longer-term mortality risk. Well, a couple things. One is that to drive care, to drive our standard of care, to drive our practice, we have typically insisted on something better, or let's just say higher quality evidence than a summary level meta-analysis. And a summary level meta-analysis, of course, this is what's available to the author uh, in the sense that these are published or presented trials. So the challenge is that that you're limited in that setting to just what whatever's been published or presented. So There are a lot of details that weren't in those manuscripts that are extremely important, that are germane to this issue. And I'll just give you two of them. One is that in those randomized trials that were included in this summary level meta-analysis, we actually don't know who got paclitaxel and who didn't. And I'll just explain by saying that if you have a patient that gets a plain balloon angioplasty in a randomized trial, and that person fails, let's say at six months or eight months or 10 months, the standard treatment in that setting is to treat them with a drug, either a drug-coated balloon or a drug-eluting stent. So I think a lot of the people in the various control groups for these trials also got paclitaxel. And I think without knowing who got it and who didn't, it's going to be really difficult Many of these patients also, whether they were in the control or the experimental group, would have gotten paclitaxel in the other leg. In in helping with some of these trials, we didn't anticipate that we should collect that information. So it typically wasn't collected. And it's also very difficult to obtain in in retrospect, in, in, you know, ad hoc manner. The other major thing about these trials is they they were all powered for short-term efficacy, that is 12-month patency, not for long-term mortality. And so what ends up happening is even though it's a randomized trial, you have a certain kind of bias that goes into it. And I'll just give you an example. If you're in the 
control group and you get a plain balloon angioplasty and you fail at six months or eight months, what would your possible motivation be as a patient or even as a physician to twist the patient's arm to come back at two years, three years, four years, and five years when you've already met your endpoint? And mortality was not typically considered uh, in any of these. It wasn't considered as a as a primary endpoint. So the loss to follow up in the in the control groups is significant in these cases. By the same token, if you got, say, a drug-coated balloon or a drug-eluting stent and you were patent at one year, there would be substantial motivation for everyone, for the patient, for the physician, for the whole team to make sure and track that patient down and get them to come back at two years, three years, four years. And of course, that's when the mortality events occur. The longer you follow, the more likely the patient is going to have a mortality event. So you can see how even though it's a randomized trial and we think of it as the highest possible form and level of evidence, there are some challenges with the randomized trials that were done. And I think what we're seeing, this is my personal opinion, and that is we are seeing definitely a difference in the numbers. But the difference in the numbers could have been caused by a whole host of things not necessarily paclitaxel. And then you look at other uses of paclitaxel, and I'll just say that, you know, paclitaxel is approved for women in the third trimester of pregnancy. It's approved for, uh, and has been for more than 15 years, approved for men and women with early stage breast cancer who are anticipated to have long-term survival. And some of these folks have received massive doses of hundreds and hundreds of milligrams given in infusions of a couple hundred milligrams at a time, sometimes two, three, four weeks apart for a year, uh, and yet no mortality signal has been demonstrated in this group. <clears throat> and so when you add all that up and you look at, well, gosh, you know, even a long segment DCV case, the most you're going to be able to give is 30 milligrams, which is you know, a fraction, and it's an order of magnitude smaller uh, than what a typical early stage uh, breast cancer patient might receive. Um, it, it's really hard for me, honestly, without using some type of magical thinking to connect the dots. And so this is why I'm cautiously optimistic that we will get to the bottom of this, that patient level data um, which I think will be much more to the point than summary level data. Uh, I think patient level data where we do everything we can to find those lost follow up, where we can actually calculate the paclitaxel doses that they got, where we can do our best to look at whether they got other treatments, whether they were in the control or the experimental group, other treatments that included paclitaxel. And I think getting all this information on the table is going to be super helpful. It's going to be a big step forward for the vascular community that we worked on it together and didn't freak out and didn't panic. I think uh, the FDA is under pressure to uh, resolve this as quickly as possible. I think we have to respect what they said in their, in their most recent communication of mid-March, where they basically said that uh, we should use it as a, essentially a secondary treatment for high-risk patients but that we should also consider other treatments. I consider critical limb ischemia to be typically, in my opinion, high-risk patients. It's a high-stakes game. We're talking about trying to save limbs in the short term. So I would still say that uh, if you're entering patients in a study, the FDA did not say stop enrolling in studies. I think uh, this, we need more studies, not fewer. And I think also many critical limb patients would fall into that high risk category in my practice until this is resolved. Yeah, thank you for so, so much for commenting on this uh, very controversial topic. Uh, we look forward to all the updates to come. So we'll, we'll, we'll change direction a little bit. So you just left Hawaii in a very long career in Hawaii to come to um, UCSF in uh, California. You know, do you have any concerns that the surfing just won't be as good? Well, the surfing, it's not that it's not as good. It's just different. Um, so I grew up in San Diego and started surfing as a kid. And uh, 
when I lived in San Francisco before from 83 to 91, I, you know, I learned all the surf spots at that time. Um, I, I've had a, a really nice chance to, to go surfing in the Bay Area as well as Hawaii. In Hawaii, it's a little more readily available because the water stays warm, because I could typically go in the morning before, before going to the OR uh, and, and did on most days. San Francisco is a little different. The conditions are more harsh. There's, you know, it's a little windier. Uh, I don't think you'd want to go down there in the dark uh, of the early morning because they do have great whites in this area. Uh, and um, it's definitely a thing where, you know, in Hawaii, I could show up at the crack of dawn and there would be a, a small group of four or five different folks that I pretty much saw every day. Uh, a guy who was a judge in the traffic court, a guy who was a philosopher at University of Hawaii, a guy who did uh, high end, uh, did the woodwork, a very fine kind of artisan level woodwork on high end uh, yachts. And th these are the guys I would see every day. And uh, so we kind of had a buddy system where you knew someone was going to be down there. San Francisco is a little different. Um, not that many people are going to be willing to brave the 50 degree water <laughs> on a regular basis. So it takes a little more planning, a little longer to get your wetsuit on uh, and that. But uh, but it's still fun. And I know the spots, Fort Point, Ocean Beach, Kelly's, Dead Man's, Santa Cruz is great. So uh, So, yeah, I'll be able to extend my surfing career in a very pleasing way. And thanks for asking. Yeah, any closing remarks for us and our audience? You know, I mentioned a little bit of this before, but let me just emphasize the story of the field of vascular. We have experienced continuous change over the past three decades. It's not like you can learn something and then you have something new a couple years later. This is every few months. Something new is coming. And yet the way we've been able to be successful is by really extreme dedication to patient care. It's by kind of going back to our roots in terms of our understanding of the anatomy and how that helps us when we're trying to learn new techniques. I think, you know, we face in a unique way competition that most other specialties don't face. Virtually every operation we do might have someone that wears different stripes of another specialty can also maybe do that operation. So we, we do have a shared experience. And I think, you know, with that, the way we help each other, teach each other and make each other a little better than we would otherwise be, we, we do learn from multidisciplinary groups of other specialists. I think it's becoming much more international. It's exciting to see vascular enter a data gathering phase that we just weren't in before. Where we do have a lot of randomized trials. I, I was talking about some of the downsides or some of the problems with randomized trials, but we have them nonetheless. We've got other large trials enrolling. We've got the expectation that when a new device comes along that we are gonna study it and not just use it. Uh, right off the bat. So I think all of those things will come together to make our field even more sophisticated and an even better field going forward. We are Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. Our team is committed to providing free, high quality, unbiased content to our listeners. We currently do not take any funding from industry sponsors or advertising, and we hope to keep it that way. So if you want to help us keep bringing you great content, go to audiblebleeding.com slash support and find out how. We'll put a link in our show notes. You can find us on social media at Audible Bleeding or online at audiblebleeding.com. <laughs>